Good evening and welcome everybody. Tonight is session 28 of our Genesis Bible study here at Riverside. Tonight we have some uh, sadness followed by gladness. We'll be doing chapters 23 and as much of 24 as we can get through. Uh, chapter 24 Four is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. Also, one of the most famous is the story of Isaac and Rebekah. It is a typology, as we'll see throughout, of uh, Christ and his bride. Uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time on that throughout, uh, and I am pretty excited to see what happens tonight. I did something a little different. I was really busy this week. Normally, I type out all the words of the scripture that I'm going to read. This time, I just wrote, like, Genesis 23, 1. And so I'll read that. And then I, you know, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, whatever the verses are. So I'm going to be reading along in the word uh, out of the ESB tonight. And, of course, because I decided to do that, I forgot to bring my Bible when I usually have two with me for different translations. So, praise the Lord, in our free Bible rack, we have giant print versions <laughs> of the Holy Bible, so it'll be even easier uh, for me to read. I know, that's just free information, and I thank you for putting up. Let's pray as we begin this portion of our evening. Heavenly Father, there's so much in your word um, and we want to know it. We want to know of you. We want to know you better. We want to understand. Um, so I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our minds to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say to us this evening. As always, I pray that you would comfort those that need comfort through these verses, through these passages, that you would convict those of us that need conviction. I've definitely received some of that uh, in preparation and above all, we ask that you would make us more like you and that you would uh, conform us into the image of your son as we learn more about him tonight. Lord, thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis 23, verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And of course, we're going to stop there for a minute. We continue with Sarah getting more press. You remember last week, um, I talked quite a bit about her, how it's abnormal in scripture, or really in historical documents for them to tell us you know, so-and-so lived this many years, or they were this old when they died, you know, that's very rare. Um, she was an example um, as a godly woman to follow. She was very faithful. She, you know, was very honoring to her husband. She uh, submitted even to her own detriment at times, but that helped God work in her husband's life, um, there's just so many different things um, that we've learned for her. And now we have her departing the scene. Recall also the importance of her having a child in her 90s, who we're going to get to see in his 40s <laughs> in another chapter here. Um, and just the blessing that that was, the joy that that brought to her and Abraham. So Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah um, she saw the promise of Isaac fulfilled, but not the fullest promise of blessing that was given, which, of course, will be Jesus Christ as Messiah through her line, uh, of which Isaac uh, obviously is there. Hebrews eleven thirteen. if you want to look that up. Yeah, clearly Sarah is an outstanding woman, and clearly she's well-loved in the Bible as we go through uh, there's a lot. As you go through Scripture, you'll find that she's referenced a lot in Scripture. But uh, 1 Peter 3, 4-6, to for example, reads, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart 
with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, or have become her children, uh, would be a different translation. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, and that's referring to hysterical fears. Um, they went through a lot. They moved around a lot. They left their homeland. They ended up in Egypt. They ended up uh, in Canaan, in Hebron. They ended up um, wherever Abimelech was, I forget, <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth, and she remained faithful. Anyways, Genesis 23, 2 to 4, and I did type this here, and Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, who were the sons of Heth, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Because you see, Canaan was to be their home from this point on. He's not going to make the journey home to bury his loved one in the plots of the family. God has promised him this place and so he starts making roots. And this is the first property that the family, that the patriarchs ever own. Um, although he himself, uh, the Bible never says, had a permanent dwelling place, the only purchase of land of property that he ever made was here, and it was for a gravesite. Hebrews 9 Hebrews 11.9 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. Wow, I can read. He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles. Well, I mean tents. <clears throat> Abraham truly believed that this would be their land forever since God had said so. Genesis 23.5-9. through 9. You know, before we do that, picture this. Okay, Sarah died. In some translations, the implication is even more clear that Abraham might not have been there when it happened, whether he was out pastures or whether he was out conducting business or where he was, we don't know. But it says that he came to her to weep uh, is the implication. At, at any rate, even if he was at her side, I mean, they've been together a long time. They grew up together, they were married. He's grieving, this rich man, this property. We know he had 300 something mighty men of valor that could fight 40, 50 years ago. They've only grown since then. They've gathered more um, servants, more workers, more laborers uh, in his house. He's gathered more money. Picture the tent however you want. If you picture it as in Arabian Nights, if you picture it, you know, as just a simple tent, however you picture it, he's there crying for her and he re realizes something that surely he knew was going to come at some point. I don't have a place to bury my wife. So there in the area of Mamre, which later on we're going to see overlooks this plot of land, it's to the east, um, that he's going to ask for. There's a simple cave, there's trees, and it's attached to a field. So we're going to have him walking into town. If you remember with Lot, I think is the only example we've had so far. As you enter the town, the town elders are sitting there to conduct business or to perform judging uh, or whatever needs to happen to be as witnesses for things that may have occurred. We're going to see him walk into this town and start talking to the council, as it were. Verse uh, 5. The Hittites, nope. I actually want to start. Uh, yeah. 
Verse 3. Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, obviously he'd walked into town, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. We've talked briefly about the bartering system. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with bartering. When I was much younger, we had craft sales and flea markets and all these things. And at some of them, you were allowed to barter for the goods and others of them. It was very clear. Now you pay whatever price we put on this thing. So the custom in the day was Oh, grand gesture, you know, a grand request to begin with. Replied with a grand gesture. Oh, we'll give it to you. Oh, it's gracious of you to give it to me, but I couldn't possibly take this from you. What would be a fair price for this thing? And then they tell you a huge overpriced amount so that you can safely say, oh, you're killing me. I can't, you're going to put me in the grave with my dead, you know, relative. Perhaps instead of, you know, a thousand, let's make it 500. And they're like, oh, I couldn't possibly do for 500. If you wouldn't take it for free, at least make it 850 or, you know, whatever kind of deal. So we're going to see that happen here. So I do want to point out a little bit of weird behavior or what we would consider weird behavior, which is actually incredibly cool and was convicting for me in my life. In verse 7, did you notice what Abraham did? And spoiler alert, it happens again in verse 12. The patriarch, this prince of God, gets up out of his seat or at least moves from his humble standing position and bows to the Hittites. And this implies that he got down on the ground, right, and kind of prostrated himself there, honoring them and humbling himself. What a noble man. Um, this was a sign of respect. This was a sign of honor. There's nothing implied anywhere that this was worshipful. This is just honoring the elders of the land with this act. And it's not like, I don't know, for those of you that may know, it's not like King Aragorn at the end of Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, one of my favorite movies of all time, I might add, where the king of kings in that story says to the hobbit, you might, no one bows to you, to his friends, the hobbits, who had destroyed the ring and saved the people of the land. Not anything like that. It's, he's humbling himself. It's a good example, us, not that we need to kneel before each other, not that we need to kneel or bow down to unbelievers, but to be respectful in our interactions, to humbly present ourselves as servants of God, we, we are ambassadors of the maker of the universe. That's got a little backing behind you. So there is no harm whatsoever in coming in a position of authority and showing respect to the people around us. Um, on the other hand, we don't look good with an attitude of superiority, which many Christians are very good at. Um, on the other hand, as well, begging for worldly favors is also inappropriate. So you have to find the happy medium. And I think love, honor, respect are probably pretty good examples to follow. As a matter of fact, that's the way that we should go. Remember, with the whole ambassador thing, that this world is not our home. We're only passing through, right? Right. So Genesis 23, we'll read verses 10 through 16, probably. 
Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in and out of the city gate, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you this field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will, hear me. I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead. Ephron answered Abraham, My lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver, silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. Amazing. He had said right up front, I'm going to pay full market value for this thing. And he was a man of his word. Mm -hmm. And he did not follow the customs. And uh, it's likely that 400 was a bit exorbitant, but Abraham immediately accepts the offer, which clearly surprises everyone. And honestly, if we think about it, it kind of surprises us. Um, verses 17 through 20. Oh, wow. How did I end up in Revelation? All right. 17 to 20. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was the east to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave at the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, okay? Remember, Moses kind of inserts things along the way to point out, yeah, this is the part of the land we call Hebron. In the land of Canaan, the field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. He says it, it's repeated, and then it's solidified in scripture so that it's clear to us, right? No questions asked. Now, sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a familiar tale too. Henry Morris has said of chapter 24 that we're about to move into, not only is it a heartwarming love story, but it chronicles a very important episode in the history of man's redemption. Since Isaac is a type of Christ, according to the New Testament, it's not surprising that there are many fascinating parallels between the story of Isaac's search for a bride through the ministry of his father's trusted servant and the sending forth of the Holy Spirit to take out the Gentiles, a people for his name, a bride for Christ. Uh, that's Acts 15, 14 and 2 Corinthians 11, 2 for those of you that like to look up and prove or disprove what I say. Of greater importance than the symbolism is the fact that the bride selected for Isaac um, had to be chosen with particular care, since she would be the mother of a multitude of nations, which God had promised would come through Abraham's seed, um, through which the coming Savior would come, uh, of which all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Now, obviously, that's past history for us, but it's future for them. Genesis 24, 1 through 9. Now, Abraham was old. I love that. Now, Abraham was old. That's the way I, he was old. Well advanced in years. Okay, so this tells us that this is later. Later on, a few years after this, we're going to find out that, you know, how many years? And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Man. He must have been a good father. He must have been a good uh, leader, a good master, a good employer. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. 
but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, Absolutely not. Well, he said, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine, only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Since we read that Isaac is 40, we can deduce that Abraham is 140 at this time. God has blessed Abraham in all things, both material and spiritual. Um, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, um, probably not Eliezer, who was named 40, 50 years ago, because he was old then. This is likely another servant. And here's another cool thing. It's not about the servant. This whole story, the next 20 something verses, is about the servant and his travel. We never find out his name. He never says anything on his own. It's always what he was told to say and explaining what God has said, what Abraham has said, or what he's doing in direct relation to those things. Um, and it's important to note that Isaac still trusts his father's judgment. He's waited till he's 40. He's willing, if you remember at the end of the last chapter, they hear word that Nahor has had these kids and those kids have had kids. Oh, one is Rebecca. Is it this one? We'll find out shortly. Yeah, of course it is. Otherwise, why would I have said that, right? This is such an important decision, and he trusts his father fully, and God has blessed his father. Um, the surrounding region um, had various levels of success with morality set forth by God. Others uh, had reached, you know, almost the level of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some are doing better than others, but it's a land to which they've been called. Surely Isaac realized that no wife should be taken for him locally. I mean, he'd potentially seen his brother in that marriage, whatever had happened with that. We never really hear about it again. He is uh, a man of intelligence who's going to lead, you know, uh, a huge family here in a bit. Um, another thing that's important is for Isaac and whoever his wife is to be worshipers of God. Uh, people who are completely united in their covenant, uh, faith in their covenant God in order to properly instruct their children, right? His wife couldn't be a recent convert. She has to be a virgin, one who loved her family, but wouldn't insist on staying with her family since, you know, she kind of had to move to Canaan. Abraham and Isaac trusted that God would provide the prime promised seed through Isaac. That meant that there had to be a woman involved in order for that to produce a child, right? Um, Isaac must not go back home and be tempted to stay away from Canaan, to be tempted to fall back into any idolatry or anything that might be there. Plus, the fact that as a type of Christ, he couldn't travel back through the land of Moriah, which he would have had to do. He was sacrificed. Well, almost. He was sacrificed in everyone's heart. Um, and it wouldn't be a typology of Christ for that to happen a second time or for us to have to relive that. Um, just like Christ was offered up once for the sins of many, we're told in Hebrews 9.28, uh, yeah, I've always assumed it was Eliezer, but um, I love that we never find out his own name. Um, I would encourage you to check out John 14, 26 and John 16, 13 to 14 for some similarities uh, with this story as well. Um, yeah, Genesis 24, 10 through 14. Then 
the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. Picture it. This old man is sent to find a wife for a young man by a rich man who is also old. Yeah. He takes 10 camels laden with stuff. He doesn't go by himself. He's got to have guards for the stuff. He's got to have other servants go with him to help tend the camels and lead the camels. This is some entourage that's traveling. And they're going to cut through a desert to go home. They're not going to necessarily follow the trade route through all the various cities and towns and everything. They have a mission. They're on this mission, and you're going to see that this mission is very urgent in this servant's life. Back to verse 10. All sorts of choice gifts from his master, and he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Whew! You tired? The journey's over. That's all we get. We didn't get any discussion. We didn't get a re recording of their prayers every day. We didn't get a recording of nothing. Because the journey isn't important in this particular story. Verse 11, And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, or he prayed, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Not even to himself, to his master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, just in case you didn't know that, Lord, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. Hmm. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Yeah. Likely a lot of prayer had happened during this quiet journey. I, I say quiet because they left and they arrived and the author is quiet about the journey itself. But again, it's about Isaac and Rebecca. It's not about the servants. The servant was aware of at least some of the qualities that were going to be required for Rebecca, for a wife, for Isaac. From Abraham's people, okay, that one's obvious, right? Godly, yes. Virtuous, preferably fair to look upon. Um, you know, Okay, there could be several who fit these characteristics. Okay, what else? Um, she should be strong. She should be healthy. After all, she's going to make a long journey back, right? So she's got to then assume leadership of a large household of servants, not to mention bear and raise, you know, whatever kids God blesses them with. Oh, she should probably be industrious. No silly delusions of life, of ease, of a life of idleness just because Isaac has great wealth. Ah, finally, she should be gracious, right? As any mistress should be. Oh, and considerate and compassionate. You know, run of the mill. As he arrives, he prays after wondering how on earth he might determine which young woman would soon be arriving would have such qualities. He would obviously have to make the first approach. But she would have to take it from there. And he prayed that she would go the extra mile, as it were. Most women, most people on earth would be willing, okay, here, you're a traveler. Sure, have a drink of water. Many of his companions as well. But camels drink a lot. And they just came through, you know, the hot lands. Okay, yep, that's it. That's what we're looking for. Genesis 24, 15 to 21. Before he had finished speaking, so he's just finishing up this prayer, behold, Rebekah, 
who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a, a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, oh, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Isaiah 65, 24 comes to mind, although slightly out of context. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But for those of you watching online, I guess it's yesterday, today, and forever. <sighs> we know God's character doesn't change. Daniel also recorded an answer to prayer that was dispatched at the time of the prayer. Of course, he also records that in that case, a great battle delayed the answer's actual arrival for 20-something days. Okay, back to the story. Watering the camels was a hard but a necessary, necessary chore. The daily trek to the well was a necessary but difficult chore. It was something that I can't imagine that the women liked to do, day in and day out, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, probably, morning and evening would be my guess. I like this women, woman that the servant saw coming as the prayer was concluding. Um, he ran up to her to apply the test he had proposed to the Lord, and she must have been one of those girls that likes animals. You know, the kind who wants to spend the time with the horses. Well, in that day, it was camels. Because as he drank, she saw the sweaty beasts <laughs> and had compassion on them too. So let's see now. She's generous and kind, attractive and hospitable. God truly was doing exceedingly abundantly above what was asked in this case. That's referencing Ephesians 3.20. For those of you that want to look that up, one of my favorite verses of scripture, uh, that he's the God of the exceedingly abundant above all we could ask or imagine. Uh, according to his power, it's actually part of a doxology. Of course, the servant didn't know, for sh didn't know who she was. They hadn't exchanged names or anything. So he held his peace until she had finished watering the camels. And then he gave her a gift and just had to know, whose daughter are you? Inconceivable. Well, not really, but he immediately, when he found out, bowed and worshiped the Lord in audible thanksgiving to God to ans who answered his prayer and the prayers of his master Abraham, and although we're not told, probably the prayers of Isaac too. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, verses 22 to 30 of chapter 24. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels. And let me just say, this is a nose ring. Let's just clear that up up front. It's not, not an earring, not a finger ring. It's a nose ring and two bracelets. They're expensive. As soon as he saw, the, um, let's see, where are we? Verse 23, and said... Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, 
the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Oh, okay. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. <coughs> We're going to get to him in a few chapters, but for now he seems like a pretty decent fellow. He is. He's a pretty decent fellow. Don't let me, you know, mislead you too much down the way here. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister arms, sister's arms, he and heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, listen up, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. <coughs> Psalm 3723 says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. The same is true today. As you live for the Lord, he will show you what to do. Sometimes he shows you only a step at a time. Sometimes he points you in a direction and says, Go until I move you a different direction. But the Lord is faithful, and he leads us. It's important to point out that you have to be on the path for him to direct you on the path that you should go. God leads us along when God's people are doing God's will, as best we know it, as best we're willing to do his will, even before we know it, then we know his will as soon as we need to. He'll guide us. Okay, that was confusing. All I mean to say is that if you start walking with the Lord and you commit your way to him, then he'll direct you. He'll give you the desires of your heart, not saying that he will give you, you know, the lottery ticket winning numbers. He will give you the desire to love and honor him, the desire to serve people, whatever he wants in your heart, whatever goal, whether that's to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or to be the janitor at the same company. He'll guide us. He'll give us the step, uh, the direction. Um, and I would point you to John 7:17 7, and Romans 12:2. So after this journey, you can imagine the servants are hungry, and the servants are probably tired. I know I think it would be pleasant to relax, enjoy a good meal, have some fellowship. Hadn't the Lord been marvelous up to this point? He's with his master's family at this point. Surely he would want to get them know them a little bit. But the servant just had to ask the ultimate question. Would Rebecca accept the offer of marriage? Would Rebecca return with them to Isaac? <coughs> Rebecca hears the following. Listen to this through the ears of the young maiden, Rebecca, verses 29 through 49. Rebecca... Sorry, I'm going to put my finger at the end here. Rebecca had a brother who's, uh, mm, uh, mm, we got to that part. Thus and so the man said to me, he said, come in, blessed of the Lord. We read this part. I don't know why I wrote this there. Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Verse 32. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels and there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. See, I wasn't making it up. There were other people there. Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat. Hmm. No, I will not eat until I've said what I have to say. He said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. Just like they'd heard of Nahor, they'd... That this family had probably heard of Abraham and all that the Lord had blessed them with. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants, female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. Whew. We're talking about a younger guy. Okay, 
Rebecca doesn't have to worry too much, right? Uh, my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take for a wife, uh, take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan, and if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring, and I said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her... Be the woman the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Imagine the goosebumps rising on Rebecca's arm because she knows that this happened. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came out. Okay, so apparently it wasn't out loud because he just said in my heart, I apologize. Behold, Rebecca came with her water jar on her shoulder and she went down to the spring and drew water and said, please let me drink. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may return to the right hand or to the left. He's wealthy, but he gives all the credit to God for Abraham's wealth. Isaac is the sole heir of this wealth. Oh, and Isaac's birth was miraculous, and he's not as old as you think he is. He tells the story of his mission, how the Lord led him straight to Rebekah. Sometimes reading the words on the page, we do it because we know that we're supposed to read the Bible. Sometimes we don't catch the enthusiasm. I can only imagine the enthusiasm, at least in parts of this story, as he retails, as he, as he regales them, as he testifies, he's grateful and he is just so happy. Are we, as we're talking to people about Jesus, are we happy, are we grateful? Are we talking to other people about Jesus? Well, would she stay or would she go? You'll have to wait another minute or two. You'll have to wait a little bit to find out because we need to point out some more typology. The servant is representative of or is like the Holy Spirit who is in this world currently seeking a bride for Christ. The bride has to be made up of people, individuals, who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and who will be brought to him in regeneration by the Spirit. As the Holy Spirit witnesses of the bride-to-be, they're faced with the greatest decisions of their lives. That's you. That's you. The Holy Spirit cannot be ignored. Jesus cannot be ignored. And his offer of Eternity with him can't be ignored. The bride must leave her world behind, Rebecca leaving her world behind, and us leaving the world behind, even if we're here another 50, 60, 80, 100 years, <coughs> or 20 minutes, you know, I don't know, and fully submit to him. Will you stay or will you go? Many reject the invitation and are separated forever from him, John 1 12, I was raised on King James, <laughs> says, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. 
He's waiting and he's willing. Genesis 24, 50 to 61. We're going to get to more typology in a minute here. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. Remember, he's an ambassador on behalf of Abraham. He's a representative of Abraham. And so he's doing the things that Abraham would do. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. He's not shunning the father by giving stuff to the mother. It's giving it to him. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. Huh. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Okay. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with, remain with us a while, at least 10 days after that she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah. And went his way. No one in the household could doubt that God had spoken, and they had to accept his decision, regardless of personal feelings. Christian parents have seen their kids go off to the mission field. They're the the it's the best example that I could come up with. They understand something of what these parents may have going on in their hearts, knowing you know, they're going to miss their kids. Nevertheless, you're happy. You're excited that God chose their kids to go serve him, right? Um, they're going to go his way, but there's still potentially a reluctance to see them go. In this story, the parents' permission was given. The servant didn't ask Rebecca. Picturing this story, perhaps it's so obvious that Rebecca wanted to go, that it was unnecessary for the servant to even ask her. She'd heard enough about Isaac from the servant. Um, she was sure that it was the Lord that had led him to her. It's not unlikely that she herself had been praying that the Lord would bring the perfect man into her life, that her parents would coordinate the perfect marriage. Um, perhaps she'd been praying on the regular for that. Just as one who is becoming the bride of Christ can no longer be clothed in filthy rags of their own righteousness, Isaiah 64, 6, but must be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, like Revelation 19, 8, the servant here in Genesis began to lavish gifts of jewelry and beautiful clothing on Rebecca and on her family. So now, in the story, finally, the Baptist can be happy because they get to eat. Sorry. Raised in a Baptist pastor's home. Had to say it. And my parents know it's true. Um, now they sit down to eat, followed by rest for the night. Well, some rested. Some were probably a little excited and giddy. Don't know who that would be. And now, wait a minute. This morning, you, you what? You, you want to be on your way? Yeah, I mean, I know the Lord sent you on your journey and guided you on your steps. Uh, I, I mean, sure, Rebecca agreed to go, but surely you can wait 10 days. Well, I mean, yes, okay, I get it. The servant had good reason 
um, and likely had an understanding of how insensitive his request might have seemed. But the Lord had clearly indicated his leading. Therefore, he didn't want to delay in following God's will. Delay, as we've all experienced in our lives, only provides opportunity for the flesh. The servant had seen or at least heard that Abraham went the very next morning to sacrifice Isaac. He was, after all, a representative of Abraham. Uh, Abraham and Isaac were both anxiously awaiting to hear if there was success. <sighs> I suppose it's better for the family to remember her as she'd been than as she would be during the 10 days. I mean, I imagine that that would be a period of strain, possible misunderstandings. Okay, her decision was right. Although she wouldn't get ahead of the Lord, um, as lo uh, we should not get ahead of the Lord. We shouldn't lag behind him either. And that's really hard. We want confirmation and we want confirmation. And sometimes it's just obvious that God told us to do things. And it's wrong to delay. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for example, advises, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't put off till tomorrow if the Lord's tugging on your heart right now. You're not promised tomorrow. Once the Holy Spirit has taught a person about Christ, and once that person understands the implications of the gospel, that person should accept him and follow him immediately. Yeah, count the cost, but delay can only be dangerous. Verse 61. Then Rebecca and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Now, Isaac had returned from Bir Lahai Ro'oi and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. He went out for his evening prayers. Another example of a religious family. A family devoted. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? Literally, the translation should have been, She fell off the camel. Just so you know. The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Again, we have a long trip without any record until after the last potty stop, and as they approached at the end of the journey, we finally hear, the servant had been a good teacher, teaching about Isaac and Abraham, teaching about Jehovah Jireh, their provider. You know, these are things that we expect were discussed anyways, because the servant represents the Holy Spirit. He represents the comforter, the paraclete, which is the one who's called alongside of. The Holy Spirit, of course, accompanies the church through the world's wilderness, the world's worldliness, teaching the church the things of Christ and showing things to come until finally he presents her to Christ at the end of the journey. Isaac represents Christ awaiting union with his bride when she comes to him, preparing a place for her, John 14, 3. As Rebecca approaches, she represents the church, the virgin bride, 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2, who is preparing to meet her heavenly bridegroom, John three twenty nine, Romans 7, 4. There are various ways that Rebecca foreshadows the Christian believer, and I thank Henry Morris again for compiling the following as we wrap up here. Her marriage was planned long before she knew about it. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. She was necessary for the accomplishment and the completion of God's purpose. Ephesians 1, 23. She was to share the glory of the Son. John 17, 22 to 23. She learned of the Son through his emissary and her paraclete. 
She immediately left to go to the son, loving him before she saw him and rejoicing with unspeakable joy, 1 Peter 1.8. She journeyed through the wilderness to meet him, guided by the servant, as in 1 Peter 3, nope, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. She was loved by and finally united forever to the son. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Revelation 19, 7, you get the point. There's a lot of comparison between this story and the story of Christ. Isaac, like Christ, was promised long before his coming. Luke 1, 70, finally appeared at the appointed time. Galatians 4, 4, was conceived and born miraculously. Luke 1, 35, was assigned an appropriate name by God before his birth, as in Matthew 121, was offered up in sacrifice by his father, 1 John 2.2, was himself obedient unto death, I guess in sign language that would be this, was obedient unto death, number six, number seven, was bought back, brought back from the dead, Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, to be head of a great nation and to bless all people. Interestingly enough, I don't know if you noticed, in this Genesis account, Isaac himself, the person, had last been seen at the place of sacrifice and was not physically seen until he meets his bride. He's talked about a lot by just about everybody, but he is not seen. He's witnessed of um, Genesis 22, 13, and 16. Though his name was frequently... I said that already. Let's see. This also is appropriate in the type corresponding to the going forth of Christ to meet his bride at the end of the age, because we know that the next time that he comes, he'll be joined with his bride. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Man, so many comparisons. It's amazing. It's amazing. There are articles, there are books all with these comparisons, and I love that this is a clear example of Jesus being, we say on every page of scripture, this point much more literally as a typography than in other parts of Genesis, but all along we've seen examples of God in his direction and his pointing towards Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, and we need to pray that we would be, again, conformed to him. Well, let's just pray. Lord, I pray that you would conform us to your image, that you would use us mightily. Lord, that you can fix the hearts and minds of Jews, of Gentiles, of people who uh, are in love with Allah, of people who fear Allah, of people who are Hindi, of people who are atheistic. Lord, just call men and women and children to yourself. Use us to testify, to be an example of grace and truth and love and mercy. Help us with our anger, help us with our hate, help us with our pride, help us to be ambassadors for you like this unnamed servant was, because it doesn't matter which of us does something and gets the credit, because it's your Holy Spirit doing the work in people's lives. So draw people to yourself before it's too late. May people accept the gift of salvation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here.